Director Goodsky? Art sputtered incredulously. Y yes although director doesn't seem to be appropriate anymore, seeing as I have been stripped of that title. Who would have imagined I'd meet you in here, Arthur? She replied weakly. Her speech was breathy and pained. It seemed she had suffered considerably. Stripped of your title? I don't understand. What is going on here? Why are you here, director? Art leaned against the metal bars of his cage in hopes of hearing her more clearly. Judging from the source of her voice, he deduced that her cell was diagonally opposite his own, but because of the way the torches were arranged, most of the cells were in darkness. We will get to that later. There was a hint of despair in Director Goodsky's voice as she asked, Arthur, why have you been locked up? With your abilities, I assumed you would be able to fend well enough for yourself or at least escape if necessary. Lucas was holding Tessia captive and I had to use most of my mana to fight him. When the two lances appeared, I didn't have enough strength to escape. Art sighed. I... I apologize. I don't quite follow. The half-elf boy, Lucas? It was obvious that Director Goodsky wasn't aware of any recent events at her academy, though this realization didn't surprise Art. He would surely have been there to help if she had known. He filled her in on as many details as he could in the quiet of the dungeon and could only assume that her silence indicated she was listening intently. It was hard to tell whether there were prisoners in the other cells too, but the information Art was revealing wasn't exactly confidential. He got Director Goodsky caught up on the attack, including what had just happened with the Council. Can you describe for me exactly how Lucas seemed to you when you fought against him? Goodsky asked. Apart from the massive increase in his mana manipulation capabilities, Art noticed that his physical appearance was different as well. Let's see. He had this sickly gray skin tone and dark lines running down his face, neck, and arms. Art assumed those were his veins. His hair color had changed too. It wasn't blonde like he remembered it, but more of a dusty black and white color. The Wykes family is known to have a keen fondness of elixirs no matter what the side effects might be. No elixir on this continent has the capacity to enhance the user's mana core that drastically art, Director Goodsky interrupted. You, you weren't able to catch a glimpse of what the leader of this attack looked like. No, he was gone by the time I arrived. Why? I just wanted to confirm some things, but I think I already have a basic understanding of the whole situation. I knew it was bound to happen but not this soon. They're moving forward with the plan much too quickly. The director's footsteps echoed as she paced inside her cell. What do you mean you knew it was bound to happen? Who are they? Director Goodsky, I'm beginning to have a nagging suspicion that I truly hope is wrong. They were both silent for a few moments, only the flickering snaps of the torch's flames breaking the stillness of the dungeon. I cannot say, Art. I am bound by forces beyond anything either of us can hope to go against. I am truly sorry. A binding? Huh, I see. How convenient. And is there a way to remove this binding? Art replied sardonically. Ignoring his tone, Director Goodsky said, I have searched for decades on this matter, and always without success, and let out a deep breath. And the reason you're locked up here is because from what you've told me, and based on what I already know, it seems I have been made a scapegoat. I assume the Council wishes to use me as a convenient excuse for all that has happened recently. Why would they need a scapegoat? I cannot say the reason for that either, she replied. There was clear frustration in her tone, not directed at Art, but rather at herself. Arthur, it is painful for me to continue trying to talk about this. Even the very thought of telling someone what I know activates the curse. We should both get some rest. Heaven knows we'll be needing it. With a sigh, Art stepped away from the metal gate and leaned his back against the stone wall of his cell. Even if the artifact hadn't been binding his monocore, he would still have been unable to use any sort of magic here. With nothing else to do, his mind began racing with thoughts. They were inside a floating castle located above the farthest reaches of the Beast Glades. Assuming he could escape with Sylvie and Director Goodsky, would they be able to make it out of the Beast Glades alive? 
Assistance from Sylvie was out of the question. Her recent transformation had left her in a state only slightly better than a hibernating bear. Good Sky was a silver core wind mage, which might be enough for them to fly back. Still, Art realized that the three of them would probably be wiped out. On their way there, the two lances had constantly released a strong killing intent to ward off any beasts, and even then, they had been cautious enough at times to hide their presence. It would be near suicidal to try to simply fly over the entire beast glades. He clicked his tongue in frustration. Despite what felt like hours deliberating with himself, he was no closer to an answer. It was impossible after all. The more he tried to plan for their escape, the harder it became to push down the creeping sensation of hopelessness. So he rolled over on the cold floor to try and get some sleep. What the hell was that, Glader? I thought we had an agreement, Dossid barked after slamming the door of Blaine's study. Yes, I am well aware of our agreement. Rest assured, you will have my and my wife's vote, Dossid. However, even you cannot make me spout such irrational accusations at the boy who has just saved the entire future generation of this continent, including my children. Blaine responded icily, pouring himself a glass of aged liquor. And I'm saying that there will be no future generation if you do not side with me. Arthur and his bond have to go. That was the agreement. They have to be brought back to him if we hope to have a future on this continent. I know what the stakes are, Dossid. I do not need you badgering me every moment you feel insecure, Blaine hissed. What you and I are doing is betraying the entire population. You realize that, yes? He stared at the dwarf. Though he was seated and Dossid was standing, their eyes were almost level. It's not betrayal if the continent is already bound for annihilation. Blaine, you and I both know what's going to happen to Dickathan, whether we try to save it or not. We have to look beyond that and try to salvage what's important to us, Dossid said consolingly, making a placating gesture. If that's what you tell yourself so you can sleep at night, go ahead. What we're doing is abandoning our people so we can save our own asses, Blaine scoffed, shaking his head. That is what I tell myself. What he promised isn't a bad deal. My family will all live and serve him, and so will yours, if you follow through. And what of our people, Dausid? What will he do with the citizens of Dickathan? If even the kingdoms of Sapin and Darv aren't safe after we promised allegiance to him, what will happen to Elinoir? Bah! The elves have always been too old-fashioned and righteous for their own good. We could have convinced Alduin to side with him if not for that old geezer Virian butting in. It's a shame. But unlike us, the elves don't realize what being a leader truly means. Just imagine, Blaine, the technology, the riches that he and his people will bring to Dickathan. Immortality, unrivaled martial strength, infinite wealth. It will no longer be just a fantasy for us. It's only a matter of time. Mind your words. I am following him for the sake of my family. Do not lump me together with the likes of you, abandoning your own race for the sake of personal gain. I'm sure you can imagine what he will most likely do once he arrives. What will become of the rest of the three races? Either a genocide of some form, or, if he's smart, he'll make them all his slaves. Blaine's response rendered Dossid speechless. His mouth moved as if he was trying to refute the argument, but no audible words came out. Nevertheless, my wife's love for our children seems to heavily outweigh her concern for the entire human kingdom, and my duty to preserve the Glader blood will always triumph, so rest assured, we will side with you. Hopefully, my ancestors will forgive my actions. This is the only way to save the Glader line, Blaine sighed in defeat. Dossid lifted his hand as if to pat Blaine's shoulder, but he gave him a sharp look. Feigning a dry cough, Dossid excused himself leaving Blaine to his own dark thoughts in the silence of his study. Blaine stared blankly at the extravagantly decorated room, furnished with rare wood carved by master carpenters, embellished with rare gems and metals worth more than a small town, and a sense of dread and guilt began surfacing in his stomach. These luxuries meant nothing to him. All his life, all he had wanted was to be the strongest mage in Dickathan, to make his father and his ancestors proud. 
yet it was blatantly obvious that his talent as a mage was subpar compared to even countryside peasants. Only through spending an enormous amount of resources on mana-strengthening elixirs and aids had he been able, barely, to break into the red stage. He caught himself harboring feelings of scathing envy even toward his own wife and children. Blaine had always been ashamed of this, but there was little else he could do. Even having control over the two lances did not help his feelings of inferiority. Instead, it was a daily reminder that he needed to be guarded at all times to properly rule over his own people because he wasn't strong enough to fend for himself. Was he truly making this decision for the safety of his family and himself? Or did he, like Dossid, hunger and yearn for power incomparable to other mages? The safety of his loved ones was what made him take action, but the more he dwelled on it, the more excited he grew at the prospect of gaining strength, of being at the pinnacle of his abilities. He thought of how his people would fear and respect him for his own power instead of the lances he controlled. His true motives and intentions became more and more blurry the more he thought upon it. After an hour of alcohol-fueled contemplation, Blaine realized that no amount of drink could wash away this miserable feeling. He stumbled over his own feet and toppled to the ground. Losing his grip on the glass he was holding, it hit the floor an instant before he did, shattering. The shards embedded themselves into the arm he used to break his fall. He could only curse in frustration at his own ineptitude. How pathetic was he? Stumbling around, being cut by mere glass. Had he been born more talented, more powerful? He picked himself up, ignoring the bloodstains on the floor, leaving the shards of glass in his bleeding arm, and staggered to his bedroom. The stench of liquor in his breath lingered as he sighed deeply. Memories of when he had first met the boy flashed in his mind as he trudged toward the door to his room, which now seemed so far away. Even before his children started speaking about Arthur from school, he had left a deep impression, enough for Blaine to see him as a figure of great importance in the future. Perhaps the only thing greater than his strength as a mage was his poor luck in being involved in this conspiracy. I'm sorry, boy, Blaine mumbled under his breath. I would like to believe that it is for the good of this continent that you become a sacrifice. Even as he said the words, they sounded empty to his ears. He had hoped saying it aloud would provide some sort of reassurance, but what he felt for Arthur wasn't grief or sympathy. It was stronger than the feelings of a king sacrificing for the greater good, even stronger than the weight of a glader trying to keep his bloodline alive. Blaine felt the soothing sensation of his dark envy being resolved with the death of this boy. He loathed himself for this, but what of it? He was Blaine Glader, fourth of the name, yet his talents as a mage didn't amount to even a single drop compared to the ocean that was Arthur Lewin. Why should that boy of no origin carry a power that was better fit for him? He unlocked the door and wobbled unsteadily, brushing off the maids who rushed to help him. I'm sorry, boy. He mumbled again. It is for the greater good. For my greater good. The silhouette grew larger. An enormous castle, shrouded in darkness. But whether Art was approaching the castle or the castle was moving toward him, he had no idea. As the shape drew closer, he was gradually able to make out the details. The fluttering house flag at the top of the highest tower, the splendid fountain carved with intricate features, the high gates with sharp spikes and barbed wire. Little by little, the shadows concealing the castle receded, exposing more of its exterior. Art could see the image of a flaming phoenix on the house flag and crows gathering atop the gate. However, a horrendous feeling began creeping up his back the closer he drew. When he finally arrived below the towering gates, he locked eyes with a particularly grotesque crow. It regarded him for a few seconds, then let out a caw and resumed its meal. What was it eating? Art couldn't see from the bottom of the gate, but for some reason, he felt the need to know what the birds were eating. This unrelenting urge to find out. He began climbing up the gate, ignoring the spikes from the barbed wire that dug into his hands. The higher he climbed, the more crows gathered at the top of the gate, joining in the feast. At some point, he became so shrouded in crow feathers that he could only see black. 
He roared for them to disappear, but no sound came out. Despite the silence of his shriek, the flock dispersed, and he saw what they had been so eagerly consuming. The decapitated heads of Tessia and his family were impaled on black spikes. There were chunks of flesh missing from their faces. Without their eyelids, their half-eaten, milky eyes seemed to stare distantly, and their lipless mouths hung open. As he reached out to remove their heads from the spikes they were skewered on, their gazes all suddenly focused on him, and they screamed at him, revealing hundreds of writhing insects that had burrowed inside their mouths. All your fault. The sudden volume of their voices made Art lose his grip on the gate, and he plummeted downward as their lifeless eyes continued to stare at him. He bolted up from the stone ground he had been lying on. Cold sweat had already drenched his clothes, and he sat there heaving for breath. It was just a dream. He stared down at his hands and saw that they were trembling. As he tried to control his breathing, an unfamiliar voice startled him to his feet. He whipped his body toward the sound only to find himself staring at a darkened figure in the corner of his cell. She stepped out toward him, and he was able to see her more clearly. Do not speak, the woman said quietly, but her mouth wasn't moving. The soothing timbre of her voice tickled his ear. It dawned on him that he recognized the woman. He had caught a glimpse of her earlier today, then as now she was covered in a cloak that hid her appearance. The second elven lance, Aya, what surprised Art most was the fact that despite how close she was to him, he wasn't able to sense her mana presence at all. It reminded him of when Virian released the second stage of his beast form, but it seemed as natural as breathing for her. I bring you a message from King Aerolith, she whispered, leaning close to him as she handed him a piece of paper. He immediately unfolded it and began to read. Dear Arthur, while explanations and apologies for the recent events concerning the disaster at Zyrus Academy are in order, I fear the scale of this incident is much deeper and more sinister than what it appears to be on the surface. You do not have much time. In a few hours, the Council will declare you and Cynthia Goodsky the perpetrators of the act of terrorism that befell Zyrus. Director Goodsky will be sentenced to public execution. You and your bond will be imprisoned. I'm sorry I cannot help you more in this matter. My voice simply cannot overcome the unified front of the dwarves and humans. What I'm about to tell you next is something that was not meant for my ears. I have yet to find all of the missing pieces, but I overheard an exchange between King Glader and Dossid. They are planning to deliver you to someone. I do not know who, but it seems to be the only reason they're keeping you alive and intact. I have already sent my father, along with a few escorts, to take your family to a hidden location where they'll be safe from those who wish to do your family harm or use them against you. Think of it as a small compensation for all you've done for Tessia. I hope this at least gives you some ease of heart. My apologies, as this is all I can do for you for now. Even if my lance could free you from your cell, once you stepped outside, the other lances would be notified. Stay strong and be firm. Alduin Aerolith. As soon as Art folded the letter, it crumbled to ashes between his fingers. When he looked back up, expecting to see the lance, she was no longer there, having disappeared as quietly as she had arrived. Art had to admit that a heavy burden had been lifted from his chest. The safety of his family had been a concern for him the entire time. Considering the information Winsome had passed on and the Council's behavior since their first meeting, he had begun to question the possibility of the Vritra playing a part in all of this. However, now that the Council had decided on the public execution of Director Goodsky, he was almost certain that the Vritra were involved. Art had originally suspected the Wyke's house of retaliating against him for killing Lucas by somehow tilting the odds against his favor. They were a family of wealth and high influence, after all. But the Wykes family had no reason for involving the director of Zerus Academy. Even though Goodsky wasn't from an influential family, her name bore weight all over the continent. The Wykes family alone wouldn't be able to influence the council enough to make them do something as rash as condemning her to public execution. Even if shifting the blame to Goodsky would ease some of the burden the council faced from the public, her death wouldn't be worth it. Unless there was a third party involved, calling the shots, either bribbing or forcing the council. Art let out another deep breath as he sat down, 
remembering how he had refused to grow attached to anyone in his past life because he didn't want any weaknesses. Shaking his head to try and disperse the thoughts, he leaned his back against the cold wall. He couldn't dwell on his past life. If he hoped to spend much more time in this life, he needed a plan. Get up, a sharp baritone voice snapped. Art's eyes fluttered open at the abrupt bellow and clanging of the metal gate. Rolling to his stomach, he pushed himself up and stretched, feeling his bones ache from sleeping on the hard stone floor. Expecting to see Ulfred, who had brought him to the cell, Art was instead greeted by Baron's unhappy face. By unhappy, he meant a scowl of impatience, laced with a hatred for his very existence, written on Baron's face. Art couldn't blame him, considering he had been the one to kill Baron's younger brother but he sensed that Lucas's death wasn't the only reason for Baron's blatant animosity. The council is waiting, Baron spoke sharply, opening the gate. He grabbed Art's arm roughly and half dragged him out of the cell after binding his arms. Good morning to you as well. I see you're not much of a morning person, Art quipped, trying to keep himself from falling as Baron jerked at his arm. The lance said nothing in response, though his cold glare spoke volumes. As they made their way toward the exit, Art noticed that the cell director Goodsky had been held in was open. Art tried communicating with Sylvie as he was jerked along through the castle corridors, but there was no response, only silence. They arrived in front of a different room than yesterday's. The large double doors, towering high enough to admit giants, were closed, with muffled sounds coming from the other side. You don't know how much I'm looking forward to the trial. Baron said, his jaw tensing as his grip on Art's arm became even tighter. Don't worry, though. I'll be sure to treat your family with the same care you showed mine. The lance turned to Art, his lip curling upward in a smirk, just enough to reveal his sharp canines. Had Art not received the letter last night, he might have actually been worried. But he knew his family was safely hidden, and that for now, the council needed him alive and intact, so Baron's empty threats didn't mean much. Are you honestly trying to pick a fight with a 13-year-old? Art shook his head, using his best expression of disappointment. A sharp tug lifted Art from the ground, and suddenly he was face to face with Baron. I don't think you understand what's about to happen to you right now. You're going to either end up dead or wishing you had died, while your little dragon is going to become a prized pet for one of the kings. You think this only affects you? I'll make sure your family and anyone you even remotely care about faces a miserable death, he said, spittle flying into Art's face. Yes, yes, the great Lance Baron is going to take vengeance for his lunatic younger brother, who chose to go to the dark side and kill innocent students by tormenting the teenager who put him out of his misery, and killing his family too. All hail Lance Baron. Art spoke in a monotone, but his voice was dripping with sarcasm. He could see Baron's right hand ball up into a fist, but the latter just clicked his tongue in disgust, then tossed him back to the floor with enough force to send him rolling toward the tall double doors. Dusting himself off as best he could with his arms tied in front of him, he remained seated, leaning his head back on the doors as he gave Baron a wink. Either Baron didn't see, or he chose to ignore him. Just as he was about to say something, he heard faint sounds coming from the other side of the doors. After assimilating with Sylvia's dragon will, his entire body had been strengthened, including his senses and reflexes. He wouldn't be able to last more a few minutes against a lance without his magic, but his hearing was strong enough to vaguely make out some familiar voices inside the protected room. Perpetrator of... Refusal to answer. He felt he could safely assume the person on trial was Director Goodsky, and it seemed the council was almost done with their sentencing sentenced to public execution. The last statement, in Dossid's booming voice, rang particularly loud. After a moment of silence, the tall doors against which he was leaning suddenly swung inward without so much as a creak, and he tipped backward. Looking up from the floor, he spotted the guard who had admitted Varai, Ulfred, and him during the first council meeting. The guard regarded them without any emotion. The council is ready, he said, shifting his gaze from him to Baron. As he picked himself up, he was able to lock eyes with the former director of Zyrus Academy as she was escorted out by two guards. 
Her gaze was firm, but her jaw was tensed with suppressed anger as she passed him by. Keeping his expression deadpan and unreadable, he trudged toward the council, studying each of their faces. Wordlessly, he sat on the single chair and waited for them to start. Baron moved to stand behind Blaine Glader, and as the double doors shut with a loud thud, the room was filled with an eerie silence. The Dwarf King was the first to speak, his eyes glued to a stack of papers he had begun shuffling through. Boy, let it be known that the Council is merciful. Even though your heinous actions against a fellow schoolmate would normally result in at least the incapacitation of your manacore, we have agreed that since your actions were for the sake of the greater good, your sentencing will instead be as follows. Arthur Lewin is to be stripped of his previous title as a mage and of all benefits that come with that title. He is to be imprisoned until further notice. Dossett spoke grandly, as if he believed he was being benevolent. There was a brief silence. Art suspected the Dwarf King was waiting for him to shower him with gratitude and flattery. Finally, Dossett spoke again. Is there anything you would like to say? Just a few questions, Your Majesty. While my first punishment is clear enough, what do you mean by imprisoned until further notice? Art tilted his head. Over the next few weeks, we'll be monitoring how the disaster at Zyrus Academy plays out concerning the victims and their families. As soon as we see that enough time has passed and the memories of your actions have dissipated from the public mind, we will release you. Think of it as a sort of provisional detention instead of imprisonment, Blaine explained, mustering up a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. I see. Fair enough, I suppose. And what of my bond? Art asked. The council is being kind enough to let you live, yet you ask for more, Glandra snapped, banging her thick palm on the raised desk. That is another issue, Arthur. Losing your rights as a mage means that you will no longer be able to keep your bond. Alduin spoke up to tell him this. Had it been anyone else, Arthur might have reacted differently, but reading the subtle intonations in Alduin's words, he knew the elf king was only trying to keep him from trouble. Their eyes locked for a few seconds, then Art forced a stiff nod. I understand, your majesties. Good. Baron, take him back to his cell, but keep him chained up. Blaine waved them away. Art studied the expressions of each council member one last time. While Blaine looked more self-assured than he had during yesterday's trial, his wife was still pale with guilt. Alduin and Marial wore stoic expressions, their faces like masks. The dwarves were both looking down at Art with haughty, self-satisfied smirks, and in that moment, he was certain that they were the ones involved with the Vritra. Art could tell Baron was furious, but he stayed silent throughout the trip back to his cell. He decided it was best not to antagonize the Lance in his current state, so he remained mute as well. Art had expected to be taken back to the same cell he was in before, but instead, he was brought to a different holding place with an actual bed and toilet. The accommodations weren't terrible if one ignored the bars. It was like a very secure room in a very cheap inn. After tossing Art inside, with a bit more strength than necessary, Baron left. Art's arms were still chained together in front of him, and the artifact was still embedded in his chest, limiting his abilities. In the absence of any windows, Art couldn't discern how many hours had passed, or whether it was night or day, but he sat there patiently. Eventually, the sound of soft footsteps approached. It seems you were expecting me, the voice sighed. Art's lips curled upward as he gazed upon a strikingly familiar face. About damn time, Winsome. <laughs>